Bonjour. Hi guys. All right, so uh, we are a little bit early. A little bit, yeah, tiny uh, bit. Like five minutes. Sort of, yeah. So we'll we'll take a bit of time for us to introduce ourselves. Sure. And uh, tell a little bit about MoMA, what we plan on doing. And why don't we start by showing where we are, which is right by the Moulin Rouge. Yeah, this is the back of it, actually. This is the boutique, and you can see all the merch over there that they are selling. What, what would you like to buy, Laura? I think I have a preference for this thing over here. You have to come with me. I really like the fan over there showing the legs of the girls um, doing can-can, actually. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I really like it. And I like the fact that uh, they've put on the three colors of the French flag with the blue and the white and the red. And you can see that in the stockings as well. All right. But what would you like to buy? Over what here? would I like to buy? Hmm. Let's see. I'm, I'm not a big shopper, but it looks like they have Moulin Rouge party crackers. And that's, uh, I haven't been to a party for quite a while with the confinement. So anything that says party, I'd buy that for now. Isn't that the thing that you do um, for New Year's or Christmas? Yeah. The, yeah, the one that you grab at each end and then you uh, end up with a present. Yeah. You, you make extra noise. <laughs> All right, I think we are more or less by seven, right? Yeah, I'm a bit early still, but... Yeah, so, well, I mean, we've been late for the previous tour, so this time we're <laughs> a bit early, so it compensates. So let's start uh, again, as if we were uh, just getting started. Sure. So, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Bertrand. I'm the co-founder of My Private Paris. We are a tour company in Paris. And today we're bringing to you the lovely neighborhood of uh, Montmartre. And it's not just me. It's uh, actually, I'm here with Laure. And Laure, you've been a guide for the last six years? Yes, six years. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Correct. You are uh, almost done with writing a PhD? Almost. Uh, one year and a half more. I'm just in the midst of writing at the moment. Okay. And your specialty is in art history? Yes, absolutely. Any specific era of art history? Uh, well, I'm passionate about the 19th century uh, for two reasons, actually, because at the same time, it's quite far away and remote from our present time. But at the same time, there are a lot of things uh, from, you know, modern stuff and all that you can still relate to. So that's the reason why I like this era so much. And I believe you also have a... Uh, uh, a special interest for a female artist? Yes, correct. Yeah, actually, I'm doing my PhD on a woman artist of the Victorian period, and I like chasing um, work by women artists in museums. And that explains your uh, British accent? Um, I don't know if that explains it, but I've um, lived in South Africa and I've lived in England as well. I go to England quite regularly for my PhD. So, but yes. you but you always come back to Paris, right? Always, always. That's my hometown, and I will always be. I've I've heard also that some nights you uh, you dress up differently and do uh, shows. Uh, At the Moulin Rouge, with the stockings and all, or? Uh, no, I don't have the skills for that. I'm not um, physical enough to do that. But yeah, I do perform at the Rocky Horror Picture Show in Paris. Wow. Yeah, there are, there are actually two different casts, and I'm in the Saturday night one. So every Saturday night or so, you were uh, on stage? For Used, the Rocky to. Used to. Used to, but not anymore, because uh, I have a job now. Yeah. So, uh, and I have a tell me, tell me about to it. write <laughs> about. <laughs> All right. So, guys, we are um, just a few uh, steps away from the Place Blanche, which is what you can see in the background there. This is where the Moulin Rouge is actually located. But uh, for those of you who've been to Paris, you know that uh, it can be a bit noisy. There's a bit of traffic. So we wanted to spare uh, the, uh, the extra noise for you guys. And uh, we are about to start going up the beautiful Rue Le Pic, which is what we see now. And we are getting started. Yeah, sure. Right? We start climbing the hill now. 
And uh, Bertrand, would you like me to introduce the district a little bit sure, and tell please, you yes. what you find over here? Okay, great. So I think that no Persian cannot say that he or she doesn't like Montmartre because it's a little bit different from the rest of Paris. As a matter of fact, the inhabitants of Montmartre do not call themselves Parisians. They call really? them, no, they, they call themselves Montmartrois or Montmartroise for the feminine. So they actually fancy themselves as a different type of crowd. Is there a reason for that? Well, I think it's a, it's a very charming neighborhood, you know, and um, you have to imagine that all of this in the 17th century was actually hills and windmills everywhere. And as you still climb up the hill, you today you can still feel a little bit of that. It's as if you're still a little bit in the countryside, not now, but you're going to see that as we climb up gradually. And it's also a place that always has attracted artists. So you're saying that Montmartre is part of Paris, but at the same time is its own entity. Yeah, correct. Uh, it was only integrated to the city of Paris in the 1860s, actually. Not late? Yes, yes, because okay. it was considered as a sort of suburb or even the countryside. And um, during the empire of Napoleon III, who was the nephew of the first that usually people know more of, yeah. it was integrated with other provinces uh, such as Ménilmontant into the nexus of the city. So that made a bigger city, actually. Um, at that time. I have a question that has nothing to do with it. I see a, a place called the French <laughs> Burger. What is this about, <laughs> Um Well, uh, I know that surprises a lot of foreigners, especially Americans, but actually in France, we do like our burgers. And uh, most of the time, oops, careful, I think we are slightly into the way. Most of the time, we try to franchise it. So with uh, the French fries, you know, and uh, with meat that is actually, uh, you know, from a label or the origin is actually quite well known. It's good meat and and that they also have different varieties, but uh, more suited to the French taste, I'd say. Actually, this place is a pretty good one. You can go there if you like when it reopens. And I think that now you can actually grab some stuff to take away. Yeah, that's true because cafes and restaurants are still closed. Yes, they are. And we are in front of one of the uh, uh, most famous cafe of all of Moma, yes. but close at the moment. Can you remind us why, why, why this place is famous? Well, you see the, the um, inscription over there? That's the name of the place. Mm -hmm. It's called Le Café des Deux Moulins, yeah. which means uh, Café of the Two Windmills. Mm -hmm. And um, as a matter of fact, it's... Uh, it's, it's called like that because I told you that there were windmills all over Montmartre, but now only two real ones remain. And uh, we, we might see them actually uh, during the tour. And um, it's very famous because it's the location of a movie. Uh, you might have seen the movie Amelie with the oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of yeah, course. French actress, Audrey Tozou. And the director lives just around the corner, not very far away. Still? I don't know if he's still living there but at the time when he made the movie he definitely yeah. was so it was a movie about his neighborhood yes yes and you have gorgeous views of montmartre so if you're missing paris and if you're missing montmartre at the moment that's definitely um, a good thing to watch Ooh, that's a good oh, these are good things to watch smells too. so good <laughs> <laughs> yummy yummy it's all it's all back um would did you like the movie would you say it's a realistic uh, view or I, it's a poetic view or? I saw it such a long time ago. I think when it was released, I was 11 wow. or something like that. You're hurting me now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I liked it, but I think I was a bit young to really understand it, to be honest. But, but I remember the style of that director because there's another movie by him i really like mm -hmm. which is a sort of sci-fi movie it's called delicatessen and uh he has a very distinctive style in terms of color and photography you you, you just said delicatessen and we oh, start yeah. to see uh, <laughs> <laughs> cookies and sweets so it seems like because guys you have to know that we're also climbing a hill that's uh, the name of the street means the summit the pike so we start to be a bit out of breath. So we're taking a, a, a two second pause just for you guys to enjoy the view to these delicious cookies. And you see almond paste. 
that that's really um, actually that's the thing that uh, we eat for Christmas. Usually, it's called pâte de fruit, oh, yeah. fruit paste, and I really like that. I'm I'm not a big chocolate fan, but I really like that stuff. This one. They have macaron also. Wow, wow. And éclair over there. You true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Éclair is the is the new stuff, right? Or it's been for a while now. Mm -mm. Oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. I really, I prefer the cafe, the coffee ones, actually. I know yeah? everyone goes for chocolate. Oh, I go for but... caramel. Oh, caramel, really good. Too. Maybe, you know what? Maybe that would be a good time to uh, uh, say a little hello to everyone. Sure. And, and maybe ask. You guys, let's see. Uh, we have 66. Uh, wait. So we have 60. Over 60 person watching us right now. So hello, every, everyone. Hi, everyone. We have Ron from Minnesota. Uh, Ron, hello. Martin and Sandra in California. There's Maureen in Chicago. Uh, Lindsay here. Hi, Lindsay. I, I don't remember exactly where you are in America. Let us know in the comments. Darren, thanks, Darren. You've, you've been here since the beginning supporting us every time. So Darren from California, big hello. Uh, Karen, wow, <laughs> long time no see. Um, Marilyn in Michigan, but guys, we, we we like to know where you come from, but we want to know if you would pick the chocolate eclair over the coffee eclair. That's the that's the most important. What do you think, Lau? I, I I pick the coffee one to be honest, but actually two days ago I tasted an amazing pistachio one. It was great. Uh, I could fall for a pistachio. Yeah. yeah. I think so but too. but the best one I've had was a lemon and yuzu by uh, the guy from L'Eclair de Genie, who used to have a store right where we are walking now, but uh, not, not anymore. anymore. No, not anymore. Things are changing. But at the same time, there are things that don't change. It's the uh, uh, fish store, what we have here to the other side. And for anyone who's been to a tour of Montmartre with me, you've seen that place because it smells great. It smells like we're by the beach, which we're not allowed to now. So that's the best we can have. Yeah. Salmon over here looks really, really yummy. Yeah. Some shrimps. Most of the uh, seafood here comes from the coast of Normandy. It's not that far. I mean, now it seems to be the a world away, <laughs> miles away. <laughs> but it's uh, it's not too far. Uh, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to walk, but I think you wanted to take us to someplace special out there. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a uh, 54-56 Rue Le Pic. So Rue Le Pic is actually a very strange street, but that's the case of most streets in Montmartre. That's why uh, even Parisians get lost so often in this neighborhood. It actually took me years to figure out how it works. You have streets that don't go straight. So we were really big and we've um, turned left and then it goes, it circles up the hill. So that's where we're going now. That's a very special place because um, it's a place where um, celebrity used to live, who's not Ooh, from Paris. Celebrity. Yeah, not N from Paris. Not from Paris. No. It's all right. You know, some good people are not originally from Paris. Yeah. <laughs> and not just me. That's a pretty, uh, pretty entrance. That's a restaurant too, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. And uh, I've I've never been there, but I've uh, I've heard uh, great reviews, great things from this restaurant. And the interior looks very nice as well. But I don't know if you can get a glimpse of what you have here. Oh, that's no, but oh, the menu looks nice. Honestly, any menu looks nice at the moment, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, this one is actually uh, interesting because it's not a very big one. And whenever you're facing a French restaurant, it, if you don't have a super big menu, usually that's a good thing because that means that they use fresh products. Okay. Uh, oops. Yeah, maybe um, let us know in the, in the comments what's your, the situation uh, for you if restaurants have reopened. Or if you're uh, cooking at home every day. I've been trying to cook at home. Yeah, uh, me too. I used to think I was good when I was cooking <laughs> once every three weeks. And two. But three times a day for two months, I've realized my skills were very limited. 
I've, I've getting better in the art of making croque monsieur. Uh, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's really nice. <laughs> but not so much for the rest. So, All right. Yep. Yeah, there we are. Can you see it? So we have a very nice blue door over there. And uh, we have a plaque. Ah, that's the plaque. Yeah, that's the, the celebrity yes. in question. That's Vincent van Gogh, who lived there for two years in Montmartre. Actually, he started to live there when he was not able to um, pay for his rent anymore in Belgium. So uh, he, he actually was inspired by the artistic scene of Paris because at the end of the 19th century, Montmartre was the place to be if you wanted to be an artist. You had workshops, artist workshops everywhere with actually that side sort of roof like that to let the right amount of light come in. And uh, that, that's what we call the uh, atelier. Yes, atelier, atelier in French. Ah, absolutely. And here he um, actually shared a single room with his brother. And um, and um, they were also sharing a single bed because uh, what happened is that Theo van Gogh that's the brother over there, actually funded Vincent for his uh, tools, materials, supplies, and all of that. And bed sheets. Yes, yes, and, and pretty much everything, uh, because uh, Vincent van Gogh as an artist was very poor. Uh, and he was also an art dealer, so during the day, he would actually work regular hours and use the bed at night, and Vincent would do the other way around, and he would actually use the bed in the daytime. Well, that's, that's practical. It's true because I mean, you know, you, you pay for a, um, your apartment and your bed 24 seven, but you use it half the time. Yeah. I mean, you sleep, sleep 12 hours a day, which is not the case. A little bit, it depends. <laughs> I'm a we don't have, sleeper. We don't have to know, <laughs> but, but it's true. I mean, I, I never thought that you could do a, uh, have a roommate this way. Yeah, but would you actually like to, to share a single room with someone? In a very depends, space. depends who's the someone, but yeah. we're, not, we're not going to run a survey right now. But not with my brother. Yeah. Uh, first of all, because he would not like it either. So it would be a little bit of a mess. What, what uh, are you guys uh, thinking? Would you be okay to trade your uh, home for a single room in Montmartre with one of your siblings? That's, that's important to remember that it's with one of your siblings. We're, we're going to run this. Uh, survey a little bit to see who uh, <laughs> who would say yes and at times it would cost peanuts really nothing but today even a single room and oh god in Montmartre it would be so expensive really like, expensive how much I, I don't know about something like let's say it's 10 meters square <laughs> it would be something like 600 euros if not more or 10, 10 meters square, it's about a, a thousand square feet, a uh, hundred square feet. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, that's yeah. a nice view over there. Because uh, yeah. remember when I was telling you about the two windmills? Well, that's the first one we're going to see. So we're going to climb all the way up yeah. the hill. Yeah. But actually, it's not that a big climb. It's, no? No, it's so, pretty okay. So not straight up this way? No, not straight up this way. Let's um, keep going that way. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we'll uh, turn left. Ooh, la, la, the, the it's a bit of a blur. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we have the sun right behind <laughs> us, which feels good. It warms up. It's starting to feel like uh, like summer uh, again. Where where are we exactly now? So um, the street is called Rue des Abbes, and Abbes um, is, is the name of nuns who actually started to inhabit the place in the 12th century. And uh, they were running. Did, did you say nuns? Yeah, nuns. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and and so there were nunneries over there, but also vineyards because they grew grapes. Nuns and wine, the exactly. best combination. Yeah, I don't know if it's only in France that you can find that, but <laughs> I, I think it's pretty funny. Well, I mean, wine is pretty uh, present in the Bible and the Gospels, so it doesn't. That's true. It's, it's not maybe not the thing you the two things you would associate first but it makes sense so these nuns they make wine yeah okay and they lived here until or do they still live here until no, no they don't not anymore but what you can still find out is one of the vineyards but we have to climb a bit more for that okay well i don't mind uh talking about wine it looks like there's a wine shop on the other side yeah. let me switch the uh to the front camera 
that's where guys if you're coming to paris that's where you want to go if you want to grab a good bottle better not to go to the supermarket yeah. but to these small wine stores like this la cave des abbesses so cave in french is not cave in english no it's it's like the cellar that's where you keep your uh, you know some of your uh, food or well as a matter of fact the wine because it keeps it fresh and if you have a bottle from a year let's say 90 a very good year 1988 or 1989 that's where you keep it hmm. so the nuns they know how to store their wine they do and now we can buy it from them is, <laughs> is it run by nuns or <laughs> i don't think so it doesn't look like it now what does it say Cave Bourdin, so that must be the owner since 1962. Yeah. Not bad. So they Not must bad. have good bottles, I guess. Yeah. All right, let's continue. Yeah. So there's a lot of people in the street. Yeah, and this street is uh, is actually uh, well known for food stores and cafes all over the place. It's a very vibrant neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the people who live there are actually quite lucky. As well. This is really, really, um, really good. What is, what is the, uh, what is the crown for? <coughs> well, you can translate it as the, the bread seller, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, pain is bread, and, and grenier is uh, is where you're storing stuff. And you see these branches of wheat. Well, that indicates that it won prizes for the best baguette of Paris. Ooh. So you can go and, there. And twice. Yeah, twice in 2015-2010. So you can go there with closed eyes and uh, it's it's a very nice place to grab either a baguette but any other stuff really. Pastries or patisserie or croissant, that sort of stuff. You can have a glimpse yet yeah, into the window. Ooh la la, it feels like eating. Um well I actually knew what that meant, <laughs> but uh, maybe you guys at home are not familiar with that, but we do run every year a competition for best baguette, best croissant, best apple pie. Uh, I mean, you know, there's quite a lot, but the, the thing is with the one store we've seen, it's the only store in all of Paris that has won it twice. No other oh, Really? Store. I didn't know that. And what would you put on your uh, bread? Well, I actually I like to eat cheese by itself, um, but I, I I like a lot of different cheeses. I like um, what else? Well, this one is with orange blossom. I've never tried that. I'd like to. Oh, there's truffle with that. One. Goat and cheese with orange blossom, or truffled honey. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the goat season, right? Yeah. Yeah, the. Uh, the fresh goat oh, cheese. Uh, this one is one of my personal favorites, the motte. The motte sur feuille. It's 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 kept in a dried leaf. Yeah, it's it's the uh, you know it's it's almost summer when the goat cheeses are in the stores. Because then you you start to have your uh, your chèvre salad with a glass of Sancerre. Oh, talking about Sancerre. <laughs> <laughs> Do you prefer goats or uh, cow's cheese? I prefer ship. Oh yeah, this one is pretty good too. That's my, true. My favorite. I was I was raised and bred on uh, on ship milk mm -hmm. from the Basque country. Uh, but then I would say my second favorite is goats. I'm. I don't really like. Uh, it's not so much the dairy side of the cheese that I I like. It's more the uh, the flowery, the fruity. Uh, you know, sometimes even a little bit spicy. So cow, sometimes feels a little bit too buttery for me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I, I love butter, but when I buy some good cheese, I, I'm more into cows and uh, uh, into sheep and goats. Probably why I like it so much, because I love butter. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you put, um, you, you have it with Bordeaux wine, I guess? Um, I would have my cheese with pretty much anything, yeah. uh, but more and more with um, white wine, dry white wines, especially okay. for these goats. I mean, the the Bordeaux needs to have, um, I would have it more with meat. What about you? Well, my family's from Burgundy, so it's always Burgundy wine, either red or white, but most of the time Burgundy wine. That, that's that's the pretty cool part to be from uh, Burgundy. Yeah. 
anyone in your family make wine or you know, no, friends? No, but uh, there you can, was. You this... can have good deals for me. Ah, I'd have to ask my grandparents. Uh, I'm sure they have. So but... we'll we'll take a little break for Lok to uh, call our grandparents right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lo, where, where are we now? Um, yeah, sure. So we are going up the Rue Ravignon. So this this is the first real climb that we're going to take and we're going to go on a lovely square where um we have a bit of a surprise in store for uh, you guys Ooh. i love surprises so what's interesting in, in this uh, section of uh, moma well uh first of all when you climb up here you have an amazing view and that's one out of many when you go out in moma and you can actually recognize uh, quite a few monuments because uh, montmartre is the highest hill of Paris. So we, we can see pretty much everything. It's quite beautiful and today is quite nice weather. So we'll be able to see a lot. And Good. then we have something on the square, but I don't want to spoil anything yet. <laughs> so um, you'll see about that. All right, I'm, I'm gonna ask a, another question. So you talk while we, we do this climb because I'm out of breath. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're talking about wine. I've I've uh, watched a documentary on the life of artists in Montmartre in the late 1800s, uh -huh. and it was trying to talk about all the um, uh, the green fairy, you know, the absinthe oh, yeah, sure. uh, drink. Yeah. And I read that there had been a disease on the French um, vineyards with a, uh, a toxic product known as the phylloxera. Uh -huh. So the French vineyards were completely uh, destroyed and so they had to find new alcoholic beverages and that's the moment where absinthe was made with a lot of uh, herbs and was made for cheap so that's why the artist would have it because there was no wine yeah beer was hard to be stored while this liquor was actually uh do you know the date exactly it must have been maybe at the beginning of the 19th century or so um more um in the middle of it earlier or oh, oh, later okay well, actually, the green fairy, the funny thing is that uh, it, it's been illegal in France uh, to sell in shops and cafes. Not anymore, because because it's actually a very dangerous type of, uh, type of alcohol. It's very strong. That's why it's, uh, what, what, why is it called the green fairy? It's called the green fairy, well, first of all, because um, it, it was made with this sort of... Uh, Thing, a product that added color to it and was it was green but actually if you go to Spain you can find blue or red absinthe yeah that's so the true. blue fairy the yeah. red fairy I like it the rainbow of fairies great yeah. but in France it was mostly um, it was mostly red, uh, green actually and uh, it has this very specific tint when uh, you respect the whole ritual when you put it into the glass you should have a very nice spoon with holes in it and you put a lump of sugar that you have previously dipped into the absinthe that you light up with fire and then you pour very slowly some water over it and, and the water and the alcohol mingling with the sugar must trickle down the glass. You, you sound like a really ex a great expert <laughs> on all these. I'm learning a lot. So the technique, the colors, the fact that it's not just French but it's in Spain too. Okay, that's, and there, were, that's there great. were quite a few uh, famous French poets and artists who were addicted to it. Actually, uh, you have, for instance, an artist, um, a poet, sorry, called Charles Baudelaire, uh, who is okay, maybe not very well known by foreigners, but uh, he's like uh, you know celebrity in France. He was really addicted to it and to opium as well. Opium was really the big thing in the 19th century. Van Gogh was addicted to absinthe as well. So. People uh, actually drank it a, a little bit like water, really, and water was very expensive at that time. Good water. That makes sense. Yeah, it's <laughs> drink because it's cheaper. Don't do that uh, back home. We're not. <laughs> that's no. you, you do what you want. Okay. You have, yeah, that's where you can see the view, and um, can you see the golden dome here in the horizon? Yeah. Uh, that's that's the Invalid. And, uh, that's so we see all the way down to the Invalides from here. Yeah, the left bank, absolutely. Guys, the Invalides in Paris, for those of you who are not uh, super familiar with Paris geography, it's a few blocks away from the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, so that's it's true. Pre it's pretty far. 
I mean, it's like it's good three, four miles. No, even more. I'm not good with miles. I would know in kilometers. No, me neither. <laughs> but at, let's say it's five miles away. So we see pretty far, and uh, that's great. That's great. It's a bit windy, so let's. Uh, we go again? You you mentioned the surprise. Yes, I mentioned the surprise. It's coming. So we're gradually coming up the stair, and uh, you must be. One of the panels is lit up. So we're going to this place called Le Bateau La Voix. Washing board boat. The La Voix was actually this sort of uh, plank that ladies used to uh, when they were doing the laundry in the river. Mm -hmm. And it's called like this because you have to imagine before the fire in uh, the 70s, there was an upside down boat on the top of it. That's true. Yeah. There was a boat there. There was. And if you want to. That was just a, a, a nickname of it. Let's let's see what it's uh, what up oh. voila. Here you can actually see Le bateau la voix. This is this is the wait, fire. Wait wait a second. I, I need to get the mic closer to you. Uh, all right. So this is the fire that took place in the seventies, and uh, now you must wonder, what is this? Well, actually, we do have a uh, hint over there. It's an artist studio. Yeah. And uh, you you have uh, very famous artists actually who uh, came through there. And uh, well, perhaps the most famous is this one. I'm talking Ooh. of Picasso. All right. Ooh. So after Van Gogh, now Picasso. Yeah. <laughs> so this was his home or just his art studio? It, it was. Um, I think you could have some lodgings over here because when when Picasso arrived in Paris, actually uh, from Barcelona, he didn't have a lot of money. He wasn't famous yet, and he lived there with a, a bunch of other artists. He lived there with his um, with his wife as well, who was his model, and uh, he made one of his most famous pieces that is in uh, New York, if I'm not mistaken. It's the big, big, big piece called The Bathers of Avignon. I think it's in the MoMA. Uh, and yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's huge, huge it, It's really tall. I think it's about, I, I don't know, maybe three or four meters high. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a painting that was very shocking at the time when he made it. What, why was that? Well, because uh, he really invented this um, representation of the female body that was uh, that was strange for the public of those days that the limbs were really elongated you had a lot of points over there he was inspired by tribal arts as well so he actually was um, used some African masks that uh, on the on the faces of ladies Yes, you can see that in his studio, uh, small statuettes that he kept because um, tribal art, African art was all the rage at the beginning of the uh, 20th century at that time. So it's not nudity in his paintings that was the shocking part. It was more the uh, cultural mixes. I... Yeah, and also the fact that people were not used to uh, seeing this uh, representation of a human body with almost no curves and very more, uh, very, very flat. You didn't have a lot of sense of depth when you looked at that. And what is this place now? It's it's a museum. It's it's just a window. No, no, it's still it's still a pretty much an artist studio actually. And uh, guess what? Uh, well, you guys are really lucky because uh, we are able to step in, and that's for You're kidding. No, I think uh, there was someone waving at us. Guys, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, acting like I'm surprised. We've been preparing this for a week. I'm so excited because for the first time ever in my life, I'm actually getting inside the Bateau de Voir. It's the heaviest war in the neighborhood. Hello. Oh, Severine. How are you, Rafael? I'm good. And you? How's the well, it's, I think it's starting pretty fine. I hope you guys at home are not bored. We <laughs> Please meet Raphael, who uh, is, has been a guide with us, and she's also an artist. Yes. And she told us, you guys are doing a tour of my... I know someone who works at the Bateau La Voix. I can take you uh, in there. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a very special place where artists are still uh, working. So you have uh, some people who are here since the late 70s. 
it's just right after the fire. As you just saw, I just went to Arctic who was here since 78. 78? So it's when he was, it was brand new. But he showed me some places that are older. And actually, we can, I can show you this. <laughs> it's just a little book on your visit. No, have you ever been inside the Metro Lavoie? No, no, never. I'm really excited to. Oh my God, we had to wait for this virus to give us an excuse <laughs> to get. It's so exciting. Wow. All right, even if it doesn't look like uh, the Palace of Versailles, guys, this is history. This is where Picasso, at age 19 or 20, when he uh, came to Paris, that is actually where he worked. And we've walked in front of uh, of this place for so long and now we're actually inside of it. Knock knock who's there? Voilà. Bonjour. Uh, you, voilà. Bonjour monsieur. Bonjour monsieur, merci beaucoup. Oops. Je m'attache les fils. Hop. C'est pour ça que vous êtes en train d'être contrôlé par la, la vidéo. Oui, ah. So we are in, inside an artist studio in the Bateau Lavoir. Oh, and actually, great. That is the painting Laure was telling you about. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, you, you see what... Oh, that's, yeah, that's the painting we were uh, talking about. Bathers of Avignon, and uh, you can see, so you see it's very... Um, strange representation of the human body. It's not what you are used to seeing when we think of a human, of a nude body. It's not classical at all. Donc, asseyez-vous. Est-ce qu'on peut vous... On fait uh, un, un passage rapide, mais... mais... Bon, si vous voulez, mais... Uh, donc, je vous explique. Oui, bien sûr. On est ici. Je vais traduire que, en même temps. Hein. Vous êtes euh, artiste euh... Voilà, je suis artiste. Je m'occupe aussi des, des souvenirs d'un peintre qui est mort il y a 20 ans, qui s'appelait Rojda. Oui. Hein, qui était lui qui a, qui a eu cet atelier la première fois. Et, et donc... So he's, he, uh, je, je traduis juste. Il dit qu'il est both un artiste et taking care of the legacy of a painter that used to live in this studio. Uh, more than 20 years ago, whose name was Rojda. Voilà. Donc, um, vous voyez ici, uh, oh. le bateau Lavoir, uh, so, anciennement, yep. il avait trois niveaux. So they, the, the, before it burned, this place, because it, it has burned since Picasso has lived there, but it's been rebuilt, and it used to be on three levels. Et, il y avait le niveau de la place. At the square Et, level. Le niveau où il y a la cour maintenant qu'on vient de traverser. The courtyard. Et le niveau où on est maintenant. And the one we're currently in, facing the garden. Euh, L'atelier de Picasso était très ma maigre, c'était là. And Picasso's was... Juste là Oui, tout ça. C'était la, la place qui prenait l'atelier la, so, de Picasso. Picasso's studio was the smallest one, <laughs> guys. It was starting from here where there's a, a shelf now. And this, it's like three, four yards uh, wide. Oh, that's, that's pretty amazing. And he told me he was, yeah, I mean, we all know that it was basically a at the time. It was, yeah, so now, it's, now, now there's rent and control, yeah. but when Picasso was there, it was, uh, yeah, they just uh, be there before anyone else. Uh, yeah. Laure, you, you seem to be uh, quite uh, yeah, uh, moved by what's happening right now. <laughs> I'm completely transfixed by all the tools and because you see all the brushes that are there. It's actually to convey different effects. And uh, people like the Impressionists and Van Gogh actually use the square brushes, like these ones, a little bit less thick and a little bit smaller to, to create these sort of, you know, broad and pastos and the swift touches. Yeah. Wow. I, I, merci, monsieur. What? Quand Picasso était là. Ah oui, c'est la fête a, du douanier Rousseau. Il a, voilà, il a acheté un tableau de Rousseau. 
When Picasso was living here, he, he bought a painting from a, a French. Uh, Le Denis Rousseau, il était fonctionnaire, ça, il l'avait pas. Il était... Voilà, il était euh, retraité déjà, mais il avait été fonctionnaire euh, il... dans les portes de Paris. Ouais. Ça était un douanier. There was um, he, he, the douanier Rousseau. He was uh, he was controlling the the borders of Paris to collect the tax, and he was a painter uh, in his own free time, but he was never. Uh, recognized as a great painter until Picasso, who we see here uh, with number two, in, uh, created a party to celebrate the Douanier Rousseau right here where we are. And after that, the Douanier Rousseau became a very recognized painter. Il y a eu donc Apollinaire, qui on voit ici avec sa yeah. copine. A French painter, uh, French poet uh, Apollinaire. Et, et là, c'est les tableaux de Picasso qu'on voit. Et donc, uh, voilà, là, les demoiselles de la cheval. Mm -hmm. Et derrière, il y a les demoiselles. Et les demoiselles d'Avignon, de Ladies ouais. of Avignon. Et vous avez, donc, euh, ils ont dû euh, sortir tous les meubles pour pouvoir mettre la table. They had to take every single piece of furniture out to uh, have a table uh, big enough for all the guests for this party. And, and so you see the, uh, the duenio, so he's almost on a throne. So th this is a uh, historical event, it really happened. And after this, the uh, Douanier Rousseau, who is a, a naive painter, uh, became much more famous thanks to uh, Picasso. And we know all of this because of the writing of an American lady whom we see here. Her name was Gertrude Stein. Mm -hmm. she, she has supported a lot of uh, French and international uh, artists. She was a big uh, figure in the um, art scene in Paris. She helped. Picasso, of course, but also Matisse or Ernst Hemingway. So she's definitely a very important uh, person in uh, early 1900 uh, Paris life. You can get to see her. She's she's buried she's buried in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Merci, merci beaucoup, monsieur. Merci beaucoup. Attendez, on n'a pas fini. We're following him. Oh. Ah, vous avez un passage yeah. secret? You have a secret passage for us? Uh, vous venez d'où? Euh, moi, de, euh, je, je suis parisienne. Ah, de parisienne, je croyais ouais. que vous venez des États-Unis. Et vous Non. <rire> moi, de Bayonne. De Bayonne Oui. Entonces, vamos a hablar. Vamos a hablar en espagnol, si, sí, claro. <rire> bon, bas. Tu veux tomber un, un, un peu de água, un café Non, non, non. non. Il, il faut. <rire> C'est très fait, gentil, mais il, il faut qu'on continue, parce que. Euh, voilà. <rire> he's, he's really nice. He's insisting on. Uh, Having a glass of uh, a cup of coffee, something like this. We we have to get going. Wow, we are very lucky. Merci, Monsieur. On est on passe tellement de fois tellement souvent devant. Alors là, pour la première fois de pouvoir rentrer, c'est quelque chose. Some more steps. I hope you guys at home are enjoying this. I'm, I'm, my eyes are all over the place, so I don't have time to read the comments. Uh, I will check that later. But this is pretty incredible. We were inside the Picasso's studio. Donc, uh, ça c'est des, des ateliers que donne à la place. Et ça c'est l'immeuble qui contient la, la petite vitrine. Ils ont gardé la, la façade. So that, that is the building that is opposite from the window we showed you. And the studios facing the street level are right here. So we, we had crossed the courtyard there. And uh, so we're not facing the street. So it's, it's very quiet, even though there was a lot of people. C'est très calme. Hein? Et cette petite maison, il y a des appartements pour les peintres qui habitent ici. Donc, c'est pas leur, c'est leur lieu de vie et, et ils restent le travail. So the, the, the house you see there, the, the square block, that is actual lodging for painters who then work in the studios there. And we continue. <laughs> Merci Raphaël. Thanks. Uh, Raphaël is one. <laughs> so you're, you're stuck with your daughter, right? <laughs> And Rafael has been a guide with us for four years, five years. And <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. And we, uh, it's great. I mean, we're not working, covering uh, yeah, new stuff. We're doing more. We're doing more, yeah. 
we're finding new inspiration, new roads, new secret passages. And this is maybe the most secret passage of all. Ah oui, oui, oui. Ils sont de l'époque des de vieux euh, bateaux à voir, mais c'est des vrais ateliers qui regardent. So that's, oh, that section never burned. So that's, that is uh, from the 1800s. In early 1900s, artists were uh, living there. And that was saved from the fire of, the, of 1970. It's a wooden structure. It's, it's typical of the uh, ancient village of Montmartre architecture before, before it became more uh, Paris and also mm -hmm. then. <laughs> yeah. Rafael, do you think she, she will be a guide someday? She looks like she's enjoying uh, discovering Paris. I don't know, or an artist. <laughs> or, or an artist, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some more steps. I, I feel like we're, we're getting into the lost world and we're going to see dinosaurs at some point or something. Like everywhere. That. There's another one over there, and there used to be one perched. On uh, around the railings so behind us. So, so peaceful. Do you guys think that there is no green areas in Paris? Well, actually, there are lots. You just need to know where they are. Exactly. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a bit speech, speechless, guys. So, uh, the sound is still working. It's just that I'm I've never been here. I've been talking about this place for the last ten years of my life, <laughs> many times a week, and for the first time ever. Uh, and same for uh, for Raphael, for Laure. So we 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 understand what it's like for you when you are uh, getting to Paris for the first time, because. It, it is absolutely mind blowing, right, La? Yeah, it's it, it's very moving to to just imagine that all these people, such as Picasso, Guillaume Apollinaire, Gertrude Stein, um, Marie Laurencin, have been stepping just where we are now. It's crazy. I, I've I've seen a uh, uh, Karen on uh, YouTube uh, saying it's like going through a private garden. It is. It's yeah, not it like is. it is. This is a private garden. No one knows about it. Yeah. I mean, if you don't live there. Oui. Merci beaucoup, Merci beaucoup. monsieur. You, you like that, Séverine? C'était bien? Ça t'a plu? And José just told me that at the time of Bateau Lavoir, this used to be the, um, the garden of the big mansion that is just on the other side of the little uh, park for kids. So if you, if you see a big house, that was probably uh, like the biggest family around here and used to have, have less buildings around and you started having more and more buildings. And it's, yeah, so that used to be uh, the garden all the way to the big mansion over here. Incredible. Yeah. Oui. Mais merci. They just told us that there is more, actually. <laughs> But it's closed, so we can't see it today. Laure. Et vous? Bertrand. Bon. Moi, je, je le temps, moi. Je, je vais les laisser partir. Ouais. Je vais les laisser partir. Ouais. Bye. Bye. Merci. 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 I feel, I feel a bit dazed now because it was so quiet and now we're back in the bustle of the streets. But we've been inside, I we've mean, been not in front, the we've been inside the Bateau Lavoir and more than that, we've seen the size and we've been inside the uh, section where uh, uh, Picasso was. Mm -hmm. That, all right, that's made my day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we, we, we're going to land back to, uh, to Earth. It will take a, a couple of minutes. But wow, what a, what a treat. All right, so we're going to switch to the front camera back. 
Uh, uh, it's, it's getting more more popular. Yeah. <laughs> so cafes are closed, but uh, we have enough uh, stairs to sit down, and it's uh, just like the terrace were open again. Yeah, and some some uh, cafes actually sell some beverages to take away. Like the green fairy or the red fairy? No, or not, the, not like or the, the green fairy. The blue fairy. <laughs> beers. And I can see some people, you know, having beers, cups of wine as well. But we could have water if yeah. it was, you know, thanks to the... And that's a good thing because I need... There's no water. There's no water. No, you can't. But now they, they have changed those. I have to press that button actually. Oh, oh really that's hard. the trick. Let's let me show you. Now if you put just a tiny yeah. bit. Okay, it's, so now you have to press so there's mm -hmm. no water uh, pouring all the time. So if you not press. Bit, it's a bit tricky, actually. <laughs> uh, okay. Go. Yeah, voila. there we go. Wow. Look at that. Oh, I have this, this sun right over the shoulder of that very nice lady. So what's the story behind these fountains? So they're called the Wallace fountains because uh, they were actually designed by a uh, a British philanthropist who is from London and uh, Richard Wallace wanted the French people to have clean water to have to in the streets because um, at that time, I don't know, in this particular one you can see the dates. Yes, it's here. You see? 1872. So it's just one year after France witnessed uh, uh, an occupation by the Prussian army and also a civil war. And at that time, wine was um, cheaper than water, and it was very difficult to find some clean water. So that's why he designed them. And, and you see these uh, beautiful ladies, so obviously they're for uh, decoration, but they were functional because it was to prevent the horses to come and to get the water. Is, is that true? Yeah, because so the these, horse these ladies, head is too big. These ladies are helping us keep the fresh water away from horses. And clean. And, and clean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh. And, and that's, you a have good, that's a good thing about water. And you have so many of them in the in, in Paris, actually. You have loads. Yeah, they they're quite iconic. Yeah. Though, of yeah. They they start now to have to install new ones that are of a different color. Next to where I live, by the uh, Parc de Belleville, there's uh, one in blue. So. Oh, where where exactly? Oh yeah, I see it. I I remember where it is on the top. Exactly. Of the park here. Yeah. Because Bertrand and I live uh, not too far from one another. We live in the 19th arrondissement, so the 19th district, and we are currently in the 18th uh, district. And both districts are uh, of quite a great uh, history. Yeah. And both districts are hilly, so we are uh, fit and trained for going uphill. I don't know if you can realize guys but <laughs> we're actually doing our sport after uh, two uh, two months of confinement you know it feels like we're climbing a mountain we are uh, doing the key one more hours the other day which usually i'm used to i have plenty of blisters <laughs> because uh, because we've been in flight for too long <laughs> you, you say you're saying that you've been staying in your sleepers for two months and yes. now that you put on real shoes exactly. it hurts yeah welcome to the life of a tour guide blisters uh forget how forget to count how many pair of shoes uh -huh. you're in look at this i mean we're walking on cobblestones all day long but at the same time it allows us to be outdoor share our passion and love for paris with guests from all over the world Thanks to modern technology, we can do it online now. <laughs> but hopefully, we'll be able to to do it with real people uh, soon. Uh, I guess you guys also hope that you'll be uh, able to join us in Paris when you can. We'll see. Let's let's be optimistic. It's a bit of fresh wind. The evening, it's what time is it? It's about eight, uh, 10 almost. To eight. yeah. So it's been a, a very hot week, hot day in Paris. So, a little bit of fresh air and wind, it's not something we can complain about, right? No, now. no, no, I'm quite happy about that. Last, uh, 
last April, actually, at the end of the month, it was so cold. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've had a very, very warm confinement. And just when they said, okay, now yeah. you, can <laughs> you can go out, it started to rain, the temperature Sorry. dropped. It was all uh, winter again. But it's, it's over. We are, uh, oof, what a hike. Oof. You know, I've, I've been raised by the Pyrenees Mountains, but <laughs> I feel like all my training is on. Oh, wow. I, I, uh, we have to share this. Uh, artists are not all from the past. There's a lot of no, street no. art in MoMA. Today. Well, we've just seen that actually the uh, workshops are being occupied by current artists and are also artists who work in the streets and they have different techniques. So you can have paste ups. Uh, I think this is a mixed media stuff. So it's probably paste up and then also the thing you do with the spray can, you know, with the, with the bomb and that you put, you cover the wall in paint. And this one actually shows you two um, women celebrities from Mama. So you have on the one hand, the leader over there, she was a pop singer. And uh, we have another singer over here from the past, Edie Pia, who actually wasn't from Mama, but she sang there in no. some of the cabarets. You, you know where she was from? She's from Berlin. Yeah, right? she's yeah. from our neighborhood. <laughs> she's the uh, edit from the block. <laughs> <laughs> she's still uh, she's still edit from the block. Um, so she is from Belleville. She moved to Normandy. Right? I think she was uh, yeah. staying in not an orphanage classical uh, type, but anyway, with ladies in Normandy. Came back to Paris and became a, a singer. And she was nicknamed Piaf, which is a French uh, slang for bird. Because she had a, she was uh, chanting, singing like a bird. So Edith is her uh, first name, but Piaf is yeah, it's local slang for uh, for bird. And you see uh, here, the artist has actually used some uh, pieces of the posters of the Moulin Rouge, the uh, adverts of the time, the beginning of the 20th century here, right there on the uh, left-hand oh, yeah, corner, yeah. top. Yeah, there's one about the Moulin Rouge. Yeah. And the Moulin Rouge, it still goes, right? It does, it does. Uh, it's, it's, well, actually now it's a very big, big show, uh, a little bit uh, less uh, intimate as it used to be in those days. And uh, you have many, many dancers there the show the show costs quite a lot actually i think it's about 70 quid uh per person without counting champagne of course of yeah course. um so where are we going now it's it's what it's not even eight we have the sacre coeur on the way with the place du terre but you feel like we can walk a little bit more and go yeah, see sure. the, the vineyards yeah definitely all right guys so we're we're not nearly done we're going to go a little bit away from the um crowds the, the crowds yeah so because i mean you know it's uh, people are starting to go uh, out of their homes again and in Montmartre there are very few cars so it's you know you can have a, you can turn the street into a, a terrace um but we're going downhill a little bit we're, we're doing a lot of sport for you guys and we go uphill <laughs> downhill up the stairs down the stairs you know, but we try to show as much as possible of Umas, oh. um that we can. There's a beautiful little garden here. So we're trying to show you that. Yeah, some of the flowers in full bloom. Yeah, that's pretty nice. I'd it's, like it's to a, have the house. It's a very, it's a very rural uh, neighborhood. Yeah, yes, it is. So that's why I told you that you still have a little bit of that countryside feeling. And uh, and I think that a lot of Parisians dream of having a little house like this in Montmartre. I do, actually. I do, I do, I do too. <laughs> and also you have these characteristic cobblestone streets with the lampposts at every corner over there. It's, uh, it's also quite nice to walk in at night if you're coming with your sweetheart, for instance. It's a very romantic walk. You are and, a romantic one, right? <laughs> yes, quite, quite. Ooh, they oh, say wow. we're going away from the crowds. But, and, and there we but, are. But not as much as we thought. This is pretty famous in, in Montmartre, we are 
passing by now because yes. uh, due to the to the statue you see out there in the world yes um, um from a tale actually by an author i used to read when i was a kid yeah. and my parents wrote me um actually the, they, they read the stories to me and uh marcel and me often write about magic springing up into the the environment whether it be urban or rural and this is actually the most famous short story of the of the miscellany short stories and it's the story of a man who has a power to go across the walls pass across it is quite a fantastic uh, skill in time of confinement <laughs> exactly <laughs> so you say marcel aimé yeah. That's the uh, name of the, uh, of the author who used to live there, in that building like that. And uh, I don't know if his works has, have been translated in English, but it's a fantastic read. And my favorite uh, story by him is called The Painting Box. And it's, Painting Box? Yes, it's the story of two sisters, yeah. Delphine and Marinette, who actually live on a farm. And, and the parents are actually not very nice, uh, but the, all the animals who uh, speak are. And uh, one day they receive for their birthday a painting box. So okay. they decide to paint the animals. Right. And um, Delphine goes to the, the cows and uh, the beef, actually. And, and the, um, the problem is that you have a hedge. So she starts drawing and painting just the horns. And when she comes one hour after, the bodies have disappeared and Marinette paints donkey but donkey is seen in profile so obviously she paints only two legs and when she comes back one hour after well two legs have disappeared from the painting yeah no from the real oh, from animal the re from the real oh, animal i started to get it the more she paints the animal the more the actual animal disappears well her yeah her uh, view from her canvas becomes reality well, that, that would be great well, <laughs> if, if you have a skill in drawing or painting, which I do not. So I don't know. I don't think that reality I would draw would be a, a desire uh, one. The, the, the Pass Murailles, so it's this guy, he, he goes through walls. He lives uh, in Montmartre because the Pass Murailles uh, short stories are all set in Montmartre. Uh, and uh, yeah, he, he goes through the walls and, and one day he falls in love with a, the woman he uh, sees in the streets of Montmartre, uh, but she is married, so they start to have uh -huh. an affair. But because they have an affair, and uh, because he can pass across the walls, well, obviously he can visit her every night because he's got this power. It, it gets more and more and more handy. <laughs> this talent. I'm I'm switching to the to the front camera now, so you can tell us a little bit about this gorgeous building. Oh yeah, which is. It, it's right called, it's, Let's get a bit closer because yeah, sure. with the leaves we don't see so much. It's some something if, if you've been on a tour uh with us, you you've seen you may have seen this place it's called the yeah, it's one of these little back alleys in Montmartre where if you have you know local taking you there, you and uh, I and his poetry is uh, One who translates.
Ah, ça marche plus du tout? Non? Nope. Ah, ok. So, uh, no worries, guys. Bertrand is going to uh, deal with the technical problems that we have. If you still hear me, uh, you can see what is often uh, said as one of the most beautiful streets in Montmartre. So it's called Rue de l'Abreuvoir, and you can see some parts of the of the Sacré Coeur just over there. Actually, I placed myself just right there. You can see the dome appearing behind the branches, and uh, you have an amazing line of houses of different colors and a lot of green onto the left side. Perfect. Yeah, we're, we're back on. on. All right. Of this one of the most famous streets of Moma, very. It's uh, yeah. I don't know we're not, but really that's, uh, that's the thing that people for. Sometimes they wait for coming very often. Oh yeah, yeah. that I can do that. <laughs> down the street. Down, downhill is fine, but not up. Ah, voilà. ah, I think we're there. We're we back. go. <laughs> I think we're back. Ah, okay. So you see, you've got another amazing. This uh, looks up to north, and these are the northern suburbs out of Paris. And uh, Maybe you can get to see this uh, small house over there, just downhill, where we're going to go in a moment. That was a real cabaret, meaning that it was really authentic, and it, it still is, actually. And still uh, get to hear some French music and dancing and performing over there. Uh, alors, attends, est-ce que ça marche? Est-ce que tu peux tenir ça? Bien sûr. J'ai l'impression que ça nous dit que c'est bon. Oh, 
Marie dit ça va gainter. All right. It looks like we're live. Sorry, guys. It, it breaks uh, up a little bit. And with the delay between what we see on our screen and what is actually uh, broadcasted on YouTube, there's about a minute delay. So it's always take up <laughs> a bit of time to realize that we're back on. <laughs> so we were, we were talking about uh, vineyards. Well, you're going to see that just a few seconds on your right. So that's and the vineyard of Montmartre. Yes, that's the vineyard of Montmartre, absolutely. And, and you can see that the, the leaves are actually quite growing. And in Montmartre, we do have a festival every year. So it, it started as a wine fest, but, but now it's actually broader. So you have uh, people from all over the world coming and showing their products. And usually what happens is that every year we actually showcase a particular country. I think it was this year or last year, it was Portugal. And you can get to drink the wine of Montmartre, actually. No, not really, because uh, for wine, you need two essential conditions. You need good sun exposure. This faces north, and you need good soil. And when you look what we have under our feet, it's not actually, you know, amazing earth. So, no, it's, it's not amazing. It's not amazing. But it's fun to, to taste anyway and to tell yourself, I've drunk the wine of Montmartre. Made it Montmartre, drunk it Montmartre. Okay. And you can see that in the gardens over there. It's actually the gardens of a museum. So sometimes we call it the vineyards of Montmartre. Sometimes we call it the, the gardens of Renoir. Because uh, if... Yeah, that, that's the, the house you see in the, yeah. in the, in the middle yeah. uh, center top of the screen. That was the studio of Auguste Renoir. Yeah, well, actually, it was an artist studio and another of them. And uh, you have many other artists who used to live there and to work there. Uh, but, but Renoir is certainly uh, the most famous. And um, th there's a painting that uh, Montmartre started to do in Montmartre. In, it's in the Musée d'Orsay. It's called the Bal, the Bull. No, 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 I have to, to cut you right oh, here. Yeah. Did you just say it is in the Musée d'Orsay? Yeah, the Musée d'Orsay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You had a, a great mix of uh, accents when you say that one. Yeah, you wanted to say it in French, but you were you were in your uh, uh, English accent. When, so, whenever, whenever. So how 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 tell, tell people who are, are watching us right now? Yeah. Uh, how do you pronounce properly the name of that museum? Musée d'Orsay. Musée d'Orsay. Yeah. yeah it, it it has to be a little bit difficult for people who are not used to the French R. Yeah, that's true. A little that's bit. True. Usually, I do that. I don't know why, but a lot of uh, foreigners say the door say like this. Yeah. I, I, I think it's quite funny when I hear it. Yeah, but, uh, in French, when we say Musée d'Orsay, it means the Museum of Orsay. Yeah, and we don't say that in French, we just Orsay. Yeah. We don't say uh, York, and that foreigners were calling it the Of, of New York. The of New York. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So what do we have here? So uh, this is a cabaret, and um, it, it's called Le Lapin Agile, the nimble rabbit. Because do you see, I, I know with the reflection, it's not very easy to see, but here we have um, a drawing, a painting. And it was made by an artist called André Gilles. So it's, it's actually a pun. So uh, now it's been um, changed, and we say Le Lapin Agile, the nimble rabbit, but it used to be Le Lapin Agile. 
But, but people we call it the agile. Yes. <laughs> Gilles, cabaret. You have your songs, chanson. humor, and poetry readings. And uh, it's, it's actually, yeah, you can see that over here. You actually have discounts for students if you want to come there. Yeah. When you write a picture. Yeah, I do. But I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't count because it's under 26. And no. that's not my case. <laughs> no, sorry. But you, you oh, since I, I know you. No, oh, that's sweet of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, we start to see the, the hill uh, oh, well, again a in a very, so yeah, nice. probably one pass before the car. Oh, hello, little doggy. I'm uh, going out of the, <laughs> of the car. And yeah, that, that is probably one of the best view. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And uh, and if you, the, the thing is that you should come, when you go to Montmartre, you should come at different times of the year because you can see the different colors in the vineyard and the gardens as well. Oh, Bertrand, there, there you go. You can see the, uh, the, um, the poster from the fest, from the uh, festival, the Montmartre festival. So vendange that uh, you have here on the poster means harvest crop. So that's the moment when they're going to get the grapes to then make the wine. It's so crazy. I mean, the the last time we walked here in Montmartre it was winter time. Yeah. And here we are. Two and a half months later, there are flowers everywhere. Look at the, the rose bush to the other side of the street. The grape starts to be uh, showing itself. It's great. It feels it feels a bit like a, the true definition of a, of, a, of a spring. You know, it's mm -hmm. all uh, getting started again. We're we're very glad to. Uh, the spring was a little bit late this year. It was very cold in March. We had about one week or two in April that were really really warm, and then it was downpouring again. So we we have a little bit of a walk till the next flight of stairs. So why don't you guys tell us a little bit if you have asked uh, um, who are your favorite artists? I know Teresa, I think you're here, so I know you're a huge Van Gogh fan. But uh, is anyone uh, familiar with artists who have lived here? We've talked about Picasso, Van Gogh, Renoir, Renoir Monet, Toulouse-Lautrec. Uh, who else? Uh, at, at the downside of the hill, um, there was uh, Edgar Degas. We used to live there and to hang around there. It's a district downhill. It's a district that we call the New Athens. And there were plenty of cabarets and uh, bars where these artists used to hang out and meet. So it's it's quite quite connected to the Impressionist and post-Impressionist yeah, uh, way. Yeah, correct. Was Montmartre a art, an artistic district before the 1800s? I'm not sure that you had a lot of artists living there, but artists definitely came there to sketch and also to make some um, small oil canvases of the place. Because uh, the windmill, when you're an artist, is actually quite an, uh, a challenge to represent because it's also beautiful. You have the wind in the sails of the windmill. So it's, it's quite a nice thing to, to draw or to uh, paint. So an inspirational place. Since the, I'd say, because if you go to a museum that hasn't reopened yet, uh, even even before confinement, actually, it was in big, big, big repair. There's a museum called Musée Carnavalet, which is yeah. dedicated to the history and culture of Paris. And you have loads of representation of Montmartre from artists from the 17th century. OK, so you did not uh, map with the Impressionist. It was here before. before. Yeah. Because it was hilly with um, windmills, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, picturesque. Yeah, very picturesque. Very, uh, you had the, the greenery that you wanted to represent. And uh, also at that time, artists didn't necessarily paint it on site with oils because painting tubes hadn't been invented. That only came about in 1841. But they could go with uh, sketches and uh, make some watercolors. Uh, charcoal studies, use some chalks, 
pencils as well. So you're saying that they were here to do the first part of their work? Yeah. And then the actual painting will be made later on? Yeah. On site. Yeah. Hey guys, <laughs> you don't realize maybe <laughs> we, we, we are doing a lot of sport for you today. <laughs> All right, I think we've reached the top of the hill. We have. We are now getting much closer to the famous water tower, which means we are just a few steps away from the Place du Terre where the famous portraitist character uh, painted as well. That's a pretty view. Sunset of Montmartre. Did you know that in some of these uh, doors uh, up above, you had little birds? Really? So, yes. Yeah. Over there, the green door, you have a little owl. Just right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So see it. And if you turn around, you see more birds, yeah, peacocks, just over there. These uh, door front and uh, up there, whale, and two that look like falcons, maybe. Oh, uh, it's, I guess it's just, you know. Carvings, decoration, and I'm not even really sure about the true meaning of it because you can actually find out some more owl carving uh, nearby. Another museum, the Dali Museum, which is on the hill, just a few minutes away. Dali, Salvador Dali, she, yeah. she lived here, or why, why is the, uh, it's yeah. the second biggest museum about his I art? Don't think, I don't think he lived here because in. Uh, <clears throat> During uh, the era of surrealism, that's the artistic movement he was uh, uh, from. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I guess he was living us in the left bank because that's really the place to be starting in the 20s, 30s, before Montmartre. And then it was the left bank. So, so Montmartre lost its uh, role. Its glamour, or its yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's a pill for artists. You could say that. After the First World War. Yeah. Okay. Well, but it has certainly not lost its appeal for locals. And cabarets and food, beverages. Started to see some art galleries. Yeah, you still have quite a few art galleries left. Some more street arts. What do you have here? Olympe de Gouges? Yeah. Simon Vey, yeah. Go, ladies. Yeah, Olam de Gouge, guys, if you've never heard of this name, she was a revolutionary and she wrote. The when you say that, you mean during the French Revolution? Yeah, yeah, the first one. Yeah, the French Revolution of uh, 1789. And she wrote the Declaration of Rights for Women because yeah. uh, a lot of women, actually, like her, were activists found that uh, Declaration of Rights for Mankind uh, wasn't inclusive enough. Yeah, because yeah, it's true. In, in French, we say that Declaration des droits de l'homme, so we, we don't say human rights, we say the rights of men. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Which is a bit ambivalent because <laughs> men can both say uh, my, uh, my gender uh, or uh, humankind. Yeah. But women, I mean, women couldn't vote at that time. They were considered as proper citizens. But they were allowed to be executed, like all of the groups. Of course. <laughs> she had this famous sentence. She said, if, if we are mature enough to be executed, uh, we should be mature enough to have public speech, right? Really, public I, speech. I like that. It makes sense. Okay. I guess. I'm kidding you. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, so, that's strange. Old painter. Oh, oh yeah, but you know what? I know what this is for. Uh, it's because every year there is more and more challenges between the painters oh, and, who is going to be there? and who the is going to be there and the terraces of the okay. cafe. Okay. And I've heard that the mayor uh, has given more space on the square here. The terraces once was real, but, mm -hmm. but there will be even less space for the painters. Yeah. It's a struggle. 
because you know it's, it's there's only so much space and you have all these uh, um, bistro uh, by the way guys the word bistro for a, a French restaurant that is you know not over the top but quite a great place to go for mm -hmm. a daily uh, meal it was in uh, the first time this word come, came up it's here at the Cadet Gascogne uh, where uh, actually Russian troops who invaded Paris in 1814 uh, they arrived to Paris passing by Montmartre first. They were arriving from the north and they were asking for quick food, bistro in uh, in Russian. I don't know if that was a good accent, a good Russian accent. Bistro. 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 <laughs> and which is fast, fast, faster, faster. And so that's the origin of the uh, name, bistro. Not not the food, uh, but the, uh, the name. So there are no painters today because I guess it's not the best uh, season for them. Yeah, it's not the best season for no. us either. <laughs> um, and we have to, we would like to show you two churches before we finish the tour. Yeah, sure. So, so what's the uh, first one? The, that, this, this one you yeah. want to talk? Because I don't know much about this one. I know more about the big one. Behind All right. It. I'll do. I'm, I'm the church guy in the, in this group. <laughs> we, we have here. Uh, so we see the Dome of the Secretary, but in a second it will disappear behind the church called Saint Peter of Montmartre, which is one of the oldest church in all of Paris, if not in all of France. It's actually built on a former um, Roman temple dedicated to the god Mercury. And the church you see now uh, celebrates uh, uh, last year its 870th uh, anniversary. So it's even older than Notre Dame. Uh, you can just know that I'm all passionate about Notre Dame. And it is where they were experimenting the uh, pointy arches and the crossed vault, but at much, much smaller scale, because this was the, the parish church of a tiny, tiny, tiny village when Notre Dame was the, the cathedral of Paris. So that's why we have such a, a different design? Yeah, the, the front is not at all from that time. The, okay. uh, what is the oldest part is the choir. Uh, and inside the church, you have four pillars that were used for the Temple of Mercury. Uh, so you, you, you cannot go wrong, there are black pillars and all the rest is the beige uh, mm -hmm. uh, limestone. And, and the front here was done much more uh, recently, including the uh, carved doors, which is a little bit like the work uh, the gates of hell by Rodin. Oh yeah, yeah. You see? So in the early, early Christian churches, the doors were made of carved wood, Wood, sometimes covered in lead, and uh, they were like picture portals of Catholic churches, illustrations of the Bible. So here, what we see is not that old; uh, it's uh, late 1800s actually. But when it is inside the church, it's much, much older. And to the side, you have the, uh, one of the smallest cemetery of Paris, which is the cemetery of Saint Peter, of Math, and it's open only on All Saints Day. Really? Yeah, so it's just one day a year you have a chance to, oh. to go see it. There's a man who is buried there who is quite uh, famous for people who like flowers. His name is Bougainville. Oh, yeah, and, yes. And he was a, a, a French sailor. I was, remember reading about the, yeah. the, tr the trip of Bougainville by Diderot or yeah, the exactly. French philosopher. Yeah. These are the great expedition of the 1700s. Yeah. Throws back flowers for real. King with the 15th was loved, loved all the flowers in Asia. And so that flower was called the Bougainville flower. But so that's the inside. Uh, it's a photograph of the inside of the church. And actually this pillar you see there, that one and that one here, plus two at the entrance, are four pillars of the uh, pagan temple. Okay. And where we stand right now is, is very important in the Christian history of Paris because um, this is the hill where uh, the first Christians were executed by the Romans. We're talking back to the second, uh, so back to the 200 or the 300 before Christianism was uh, allowed in the Roman Empire. And there's a legend here that says that the first bishop of Paris, who was known as Saint Denis, was actually beheaded right here with two other priests. Uh, one of them. It's actually the name of the street here. We, we don't see this. Um, well, it's Le Terre, Le Terre. 
They, so all three were beheaded, but St. Denis picked up his head after being beheaded. I, I have to switch the camera because uh, the world needs to see your face while I'm telling you that story. <laughs> so he's, be, he's beheaded, picks up his head after being beheaded, mm -hmm. even in the Rocky Horror Picture. You don't see that. No, we, we had we had a Tim Burton show special once, but we didn't have that, and we didn't have the uh, headless horseman. <laughs> and uh, picked up his head, kept on walking, and he's the the patron saint uh, of Paris since since. Then. So that could be the origin of the name of that neighborhood. Montmartre could be the Mount of Martyrs, mm -hmm. Mont des Martyrs in French, or it could be also the Mount of Mars. The, the uh, Roman God of War, who was uh, prayed here really? alongside with Mercury. Which one do you believe? Which one do, Which you one do I believe? Yeah. I, I don't want to pick one because then I only have one story. Okay. Uh, I'd rather have more than uh, more than one story. How about, how about that for a politically correct answer? <laughs> well, 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 while we make jokes, I would tell jokes, we have quite a stunning view here. Maybe, hopefully, you guys can see what's happening. Maybe we'll do a live tour from, from it when it reopens. It's a bit in the distance. You, uh, it's, yeah, it's behind the chimney. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do see it like that. The Eiffel Tower. Yeah. yeah. So we, we see pretty, pretty far away. Because we're almost um, because we're almost done, we are on the way to the, the big church uh, of Montmartre, one of the uh, biggest in Paris, too. The name of it, again, is... Sacré Coeur. That's another hard one to say. <laughs> the Sacré Coeur... The sacred, it means sacred heart, or it's dedicated to the sacred, sacred heart of Jesus. It's not that old of a church, is it? No, it started to be built in uh, 1873 and uh, took quite a few years to be completed because it's big, actually. And, and what I think is interesting in it, uh, you're going to see this when we're facing it, but it's a mixture of different styles. So you're going to recognize a little bit of Romanesque with the round arches. You're going to recognize traits from Gothic architecture with the uh, gargoyles. And um, also a little bit of the Oriental architecture, the style that we call Neo-Byzantine that you have in a beautiful basilica in Turkey, for instance. That is for dome. So a big mix of local yeah. and foreign. And foreign. Uh, right. Oh, wait. I'm going to switch back the camera because we start to see it. Voila. And you can get to see the two uh, statues over there, the four statues. So one of them is a Joan of Arc, I think. Yeah. And the other is uh, St. Louis. Saint, yeah, St. Stay. I love this the view from here, where we don't see it yet entirely. We still have the old uh, water tower wall, the lamp post, and yeah. then the dome. The, the dome are the non-local uh, arch, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And guys, if uh, when you're able to come back to Paris, and uh, if you're in good shape, I really recommend, I did that last summer, to climb to the top. You can climb all the you, way to the top? Yes, you can. You can climb to, uh, the, I don't know if it, if you're really there or in the next tower, but you're super high and it's amazing. Because it's you or Paris is absolutely astounding. And it's not so so expensive, actually. It's uh, less than 10 euros. But, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's walking up, it's climbing stairs, right? Yes, no elevator. I'm not sure. I don't think that you have a lift. Uh, talking about churches, tomorrow or even today is the first day that um, mass is uh, offices are allowed back in uh, religious uh, yeah. sites. Yeah, that's true. So all all churches, mosques, synagogues, temples were uh, closed during the confinement. There was there was no authorization for any religious celebration. And starting today, yeah, starting today. That it's back to being uh, allowed. We were uh, step by step, but we're getting back 
uh, our, our freedom, our ability uh, to do uh, things. And for instance, to go with your views like so that's the gorgeous view of Paris. And that's where we live. Yeah. Which, yeah. It's still sunny in Delhi. Yeah. Rock on. <laughs> that's great. Cool. Yeah, the, 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 hit, the sunny side is where Laura and I will live. Then next to it, there's a bit of green space, which is the Palaché Cemetery. That's the east of Paris. Now we're looking south, and you can see the center and maybe even the towers of Notre Dame to Montparnasse to the other side out there. Maybe we could sit down uh, here for a second for it to say thanks. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh my god, that's quite great with such a girl behind us. Yeah. Not, right. not, not, not bad as a uh, as a uh, Goodbye. Uh, oh, oui. oh, I uh, okay. oh, we can't sit down. Let's make up. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. We have to walk. Uh, it's uh, we we've, we've been asked by a police officer to uh, not sit. Uh, we have to stay mobile. Okay. <laughs> like in the home song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can't we can't really stand. Uh, I, no, no. I, it's it's just that we can't sit, but we can stand. We can work. We yeah, can we can stand we, or we can say we're taking yeah. a, a self. Yeah. So um, it's been quite an amazing tour. Yeah. I mean, we've started by the Moulin Rouge. We've seen that you can buy a, a fan with the, the stockings and all. Mm -hmm. that was, we've seen a lot of great food. We've seen the the studio. Uh, you showed us the studio where Mango uh, um, was living with his brother, and then we had this moment. It was so amazing to yeah. be able to. Uh, walk inside the Bateau Lavoie and see the studio of Picasso. I hope you guys were here to see that. Uh, otherwise, there will be a, a replay available from uh, Monday on. Uh, what else did we do? Well, after that, we went slightly towards the left and uh, we were on the Marcel Aimé Square where yeah, you could see the yeah. man passing through the walls. We've seen a lot of street art even before. Yes, we yeah. did. We did. And art, then... art is not dead. No, never, <laughs> never. No, probably were out there during confinement in the street with night. For sure. And uh, we went through Fog Alley. True. And then up uh, towards the Sacre Coeur, uh, having, uh, taking a look at the vineyards. That's true. Maybe this would be a, 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 a quite a year to remember. So maybe a bottle of Montmartre. Not yeah. to drink it. We told you it's not really good. It's more to keep the bottle as a souvenir. Yeah. But a 2020, which in French is 2020. So, you know, 2020. Oh, yeah. That's we, yeah. We, 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 call, we say 2020, which could sound like wine, wine. So mm -hmm. double, uh, double chance to have a, uh, a wine, uh, <laughs> two bottles of wine. Um, maybe we could buy that for uh, Oleg. Oleg is one of, of our guides. Oh. Who doesn't drink. Who doesn't drink, you're right. <laughs> uh, but we could bring that to a party because it's his birthday today. Oh, really? Oh, so happy, happy birthday, Oleg. Ha happy birthday to Oleg. Maybe some of you have been on a, a, a tour uh, with Oleg. Voilà. Camera, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Camera is going away from the house. She's, she's asking why. Um, it's so Oleg's birthday. Uh, so, well maybe two bottles of wine that's mm -hmm. what we're saying um and next week we are going to do a tour with charlotte uh, a tour of the catacombs oh that's spooky so that's that's yeah. going to be quite great because uh, charlotte really is a, a great expert in the catacombs so it's not open yet so that will be a, a tour from home but we'll, we'll show you a lot of uh, abstracts uh, of you know clips we've made out there a lot of photographs and understand you know what's what's this, the, the history behind this uh, amazing catacombs and um if you guys like uh, this tour if you like the past tours you can have access to them uh, for free and uh, you can help us out there is a link right down the the video here that's the moment where we're asking for tips <laughs> uh, you have to know guys that laura and i we started our career uh, as guides uh, with uh, free tools 
Where, oh yeah. So it feels like we're back to uh, two square one, uh, three tools in the streets of Paris where people could join and just uh, give what they want at the end. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, like today. Yeah. You know, we're, we're back to free tour uh, category, but seriously, it's it's been quite moving to see how many uh, of you have helped us in this past week. So thank you very much for that. Uh, also, let us know. You know, we try to get better because we're we're not tech people. Um, yeah, yeah, not at all. Um, and um, so any uh, advice uh, help us get uh, a little bit better. Uh, we start to use, uh, there's someone, Ginger, Ginger Greenstein told me it would be better to use a stick for the microphone. So, you know, this is <laughs> this is the innovation of today. We, we have a, a, a microphone up here on a stick. We use a stabilizer now for, for these. So we're, we're getting a, a little bit better. And every week, we will keep on delivering these uh, these tools uh, for you until you can come back to the Paris with us. Yeah, I will definitely join the category star one because I'm claustrophobic. So that would be a big first for me. I will be able to join the catacombs tour. Have you been to the inside the catacombs? Never. Never. I, no, no, no. I, 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 I would be terrified. So, so this is actually a good way for you <laughs> yes, exactly. to visit the catacombs from the uh, comfort of your home. Thanks. Uh, very, very much to all of you for watching us today. This was Laure of Nermel, our art historian, and proud member of the team uh, of My Pride Paris. And I don't have to say my name, you all know me, right? Allez, <laughs> cheers. <laughs>